Hello, and welcome to episode 8 of Wizard of Paws Podcast, the greatest show about animals on the All Indiana Podcast Network. I'm your host, River. And I'm Dr. Jace. And I'm not exactly sure what we're talking about this week. I kind of wanted to go into it blind just with the rest of you all. So what do we got? <laughs> Today we're going to talk about bush dogs. Bush dogs. I think I had a nickname like that in college. I bet you did, you stinky werewolf. Oh, you know it. Yeah, he smells like... Okay, so uh, River is a <laughs> werewolf because they uh, literally smell like a wet dog all the time. It's kind of gross. A werewolf that doesn't know how to change. Yeah, I know. He's he's just there and <laughs> wasting my space. Anyway, so we're going to talk about bush dogs. Spiotus vinaticus, a.k.a. Choro vinegar. Delicious. The vinegar. It's called the vinegar dog or vinegar puppy. And the reason for this is, can you guess why? Um, they bust up a bottle of vinegar and roll it around in it? <laughs> They're not Star-Lord, okay? Uh-huh. Uh, okay, vinegar dogs are... Um, they're actually called vinegar dogs because of their urine. It smells like vinegar. Like distilled vinegar, balsamic vinegar? I don't know. Why don't you go ask the damn zoo, okay? Ooh, do we have one? Uh, we don't have any in the United States, I don't think. So you're going to have to take a trip down to Brazil. So can I go ahead and put that on the business tab? Absolutely not. I'll stab you and take away all your cards. you got to use your own damn money, bitch. <laughs> all right, so these little guys are about 11 to 18 pounds, and they only have three recognized subspecies. They're not like, you know, our foxes, which have, you know, over 40 subspecies. Um, they're a threatened canid species found in Central and South America, and... These little guys, um, it's really rare in most areas to find them, except for like Suriname, Guyana, Brazil, Peru, and Brazil. And they were first discovered by a guy named Peter Willem Lund from fossils, and they were believed to have been extinct at the time. Wow, so we just heard about them through fossils? Yeah, that's how we found out that they existed. We found fossils of them. And the bush dog is the only living species in the genus Speothos. And genetic evidence suggests that its closest living relative is the maned wolf. Okay, so these guys are really interesting. They have partially webbed toes, which allow them to swim more efficiently, kind of like otters. I see that a lot in a lot of different animals. Yeah, not really. Uh, not many canid species have webbed feet. These guys do. Their legs are really short, too. So they're kind of like little tiny bears. Definitely um, not getting the legs of the main wolf, then. If you if you look up this this creature, it kind of looks like um, it would be related to, like, our, uh, our North American badgers or a wolverine or some, of some sort, you know, because of the way it, it looks. And um, you yeah, wouldn't yeah. expect this little short-legged thing to be, a, uh, you know, a canid. Because it doesn't even look like most of the canids we have out there. Yeah, it's usually kind of like a little teddy bear or something. It does. It looks like a little <laughs> teddy bear. And there was Pointy one, teeth. There was one photo that looked like Megumi <laughs> 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 when she did something bad. <laughs> kind of that glare. Yeah, uh, yeah, the glare with the squinting eyes. Mm-hmm. Whereas it's like, uh, are you judging me, bro? <laughs> Pretty much what the pale fox looks like all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so th- even though this is a canid species, it cannot hybridize with other canids because uh, Speothos um, has a diploid chromosome number of 72. Um, so I'm not going to get into genetics with people because a lot of people just kind of zone out when I start talking about <laughs> genetics. So if you really want to know about the diploid chromosome number of 72 and how that relates to hybridization, you guys can send me a message. And I will be glad to talk to you about it. But most people don't understand that stuff, so we're going to cut that out. These guys can run about 9 to 12 miles an hour. So they're, they're pretty fast for little short-legged things. I was about to say, short little legs. I can't uh, even run that fast. I know. <laughs> I, know I, can, I used to be able to run that fast. So primarily, these guys live in, like, uh, lowland forests up to 6,200 feet in elevation, wet savannas, and other habitats near rivers. And they're occasionally found in drier cerrados and open pastures, but not very often. Um... There was a a scientific study titled Comments on Indian Practices in Trinidad. Tetrapods from the Manzanilla site said that very recent fossils dating from 300 AD to 900 AD, that's the late ceramic age, have been found in the Manzanilla site and on the east coast of Trinidad, Um, which is pretty interesting because these guys have been around for a long time. 
Yeah, like, have they changed much over the years? Mm -mm. No, they haven't really changed that much. There's not. It's kind of like crocodiles. <laughs> There's not very much evolution. No, they're not like crocodiles. Those things, and I swear, if a meteor strikes, they'll be the only ones to live <laughs> besides the cockroaches. Um, so these are carnivores that are hunt hunting during the day. So typically their prey are uh, pacas, agoutis, capybaras, and all the large rodents that live in South America. Although they can hunt alone, bush dogs are usually found in small social groups. Okay, I like to use the term social grouping as opposed to the term packs because that whole alpha theory thing was already debunked by the guy that created it so i do not i don't um follow that whole alpha theory pack leader bullshit it's kind of interesting how some guy could just make something up like hey that sounds like a good idea we're going to continue that for oh i don't know x 60 <laughs> decades or x amount of years and then decide that my science was wrong uh i mean you know of course a new science comes in and we find out more things as we get older and and we uh, learn more and it's it's fascinating as a scientist it takes a lot of character in order to say hey i was wrong about this publicly oh yeah so you don't get that very often. you don't get it very often in any case let alone a scientist they don't ever want to admit they're wrong believe me i know that for a fact because i don't ever want to say that i'm wrong even though when i am but i do like to learn new things so i'm fine when someone points out hey you might have been wrong about this in your podcast so here's some uh you know literature read up on this and <laughs> see if <laughs> see if it's right and i'll be like okay yes thank you yeah i'll send you that and see how well that goes over you are not allowed to criticize me because you don't <laughs> do it constructively you're just an ass i am a bit of an ass you like to die. You're tired of your life, aren't you? Not since I started taking antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, don't lose your bottle. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a mild threat. <laughs> <laughs> Take it how you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these guys, they, um, they, they live in small social groups, which... Um, these guys are really small, but they can hunt on a lot larger prey, including peccaries and rheas, okay? Peccaries are really big birds. They're kind of like the ostrich of South America. All right. Um, and the rheas are kind of like that, but maybe not as big. Yeah, same thing. And, 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 the, and a group of six bush dogs ha was reported for hunting a tapir weighing 550 pounds. These, uh, these little, uh, you know, animals that live, or they, they only weigh about like six, 11 to 18 pounds a piece, and six of them took down a 550 pound tapir. It's a big ass animal. Tapir's kind of like that little mini elephant thing. It's a little tiny trunk, like little, little tiny trunk. Yeah, it's cute. <laughs> it's a really cute animal. Okay, so destroyed by five dogs. <laughs> destroyed by six dogs. Six dogs. <laughs> and when hunting Paca, part of the group chases it on land, while the other part waits for it in the water, and it, where the packas often retreat. Um, and this is the Art of War Nature Edition, okay? No. Sun Tzu Art of War. <laughs> it makes me wonder if Sun Tzu actually was watching animals when he wrote the Art of War. No, oh, I bet he got some inspiration I, from it. I bet he did too, because you, when you see lions and cheetahs hunt and you're watching them hunt these, their prey, you see they do it in a structural way. The good ones do. The good, yeah, when they have a good working dynamic, they, they, they definitely do. Um, so... These, these groups, these social groups, consist of a single breeding pair, which they are monogamous, and they mate for life, and they're immediate relations, okay? And only the adults breed, while the others are subordinate, subordinate and help with rearing the puppies um, and guarding the puppies. So these guys can breed year-round, and uh, they, they actually keep in contact with each other through frequent wines because the visibility is poor in the undergrowth where they hunt. Um, My family communicates through wines, too. Yeah, I bet they do. <laughs> the red wines, the white wines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I bet so your family uses screeches. My family does use screeches because <laughs> they're a bunch of demons. <laughs> uh, I hope my dad doesn't hear this. Ah, he's Hi, awesome. Dad. <laughs> uh, monogamy in animals is actually quite rare. It only occurs in about 3 to 9% of the known species on the planet Earth, and that includes humans. Avian birds are the most monogamous because their uh, their uh, monogamy rate jumps to ninety percent alone. It probably helps when you're taking care of eggs. Yeah, it does. Cause you know either mom or dad will stay on the on the eggs, and um, you know the other one will bring back food and stuff like that. 
uh, eagles are pretty good about it. You can actually observe some of them in, in some videos. Maybe we'll talk about an avian bird next time. I want to talk about birds of prey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sadly, even in captivity, these guys don't live very long. But they usually die about six months old to one year old in the wild. But they can live about ten years in captivity, maximum. So you got about the same lifespan as a ferret, if you're lucky. I mean... Yeah, I mean, if you're going with averages, it's about right. Yeah. So... Uh, the reason why their population is threatened. So the IUCN Red List listed these guys as a threatened species. And the reason why is there are several re reasons. Human enroachment is one of them. Intact habitat loss as a result from large-scale large agriculture conversion of the, the land into pasture. Um, so I want to get on the topic of if, if people are going to go and teach other countries how to do agricultural farming and in order to you know better their you know, production or, or help feed the people that are starving or whatnot they also got to think about the environment because not only are they going to take away the land from the animals that are there they're going to also take away the prey from those animals ah, so that's so well to last week's episode it does <laughs> so these guys um they have a lot of issues because you know Humans are getting too close to them. Humans are taking their spice away. So, honestly, they sh we shouldn't do what we did with the Tasmanian tiger. And I'm going to straight up go on this. I will go on a rant on the Tasmanian tiger every single time. Because what we did was we hunted the Tasmanian tiger into complete extinction. To where the only ones that existed were in the zoos. And we only have very little footage of them, period. Um, kind of the way the singing dog is going. Yeah, that's kind of the way the singing dog is going. Honestly, I, I thought that it would... You know, it, if you're going to teach someone about agricultural, um, you know, development and stuff like that, you also should have someone to teach them about conservation of the species in the area as well. I think that ties in together because if you can work together with the local, you know, animals in helping keeping the rodent population from getting into your, you know, food that you're trying to plant oh, yeah. to feed the populace, you, you're, you're trying to run off these, these larger creatures, you know, I mean, they're not very big, but... They, they look scary to people who aren't familiar with them, you know, or I've never seen that animal before. Why is it on my property? I'm going to shoot at it. Yeah, all things are scary when you don't really know what they are. <laughs> well, not to me. Anyone who's afraid of nothing is a coward. Um, anyone who's afraid of everything is a coward. Um, fear nothing. Live life how you feel. But these guys... Honestly, I, I do believe that a conservationist should go with them and, and stuff and talk about how they should, you know, work together with the local populace of animals that are na natural to the area. Because, you know, I mean, even though you're removing their trees, they're still going to hunt in the area. Oh, yeah. And if you're killing the bush dogs, you're going to have a rodent infestation. You'd have to be upsetting some kind of balance. Yeah, you're going to offset the balance of the, the ecosystem in the area. And that... Extreme um, butterfly effect. It is an extreme butterfly effect because the other reason, um, one of the other reasons why they are, are threatened is because uh, illegal poaching, it, it, it reduces the prey that they hunt because the uh, people are illegally poaching the rodents that they hunt because, you know, capybara fur, capybaras are pretty big, I mean. Yeah. Um, domestic dog predation is another one. Domestic dogs attacking the bush dogs and increased risk of lethal diseases is contracting from the, those domestic animals. So they're bringing, you know, parvo and distemper into the animals, into these wild animals area. So if a bush dog's decided to try, you know, to migrate somewhere else, they're they're taking, you know, parvo and, and distemper with them. and Yeah, carry around their little feetsies just like everyone else. Yep. They carry it around and they drop it and other animals will get it. And this is the reason why you should vaccinate your animals, even in third world countries. I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it. There are programs that can get vaccinations for free. Um, it's just not easy to get funding for it. I know that, but I do believe that if we get enough people, we can advocate for that. But I do believe that humans are also the issue. Oh, yeah, we're definitely issue of a lot of things. But yeah. Um, I don't want to say I'm anti-human, but I really don't like the human species. <laughs> I think it just needs some help. Anyway, let's get back on topic here. Um, I think that I've covered a little bit about uh, the vinegar dogs or the uh, the beautiful little uh, bush dog. I think they're adorable. They're, <laughs> they're the very rare animals, so there's not very many things out there about them. I do have some scientific studies if those um, people
people are interested in reading them, we will post the links in the bottom of our YouTube video that we put the podcast on. Oh, yeah. And in that n- other news, I uh, I want to yes. release it, uh, you know, uh, for Columbus Day. Ah, uh, yes. This comes uh, out around the uh, day right before, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, or Indigenous see. Peoples Day. Yeah. Well, you know. Fair. Uh, so... There's a rumor, it's like a conspiracy going around that Christopher Columbus had intercourse with a manatee. And Look uh, at it. <laughs> sick bastard. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, there was a, what happened was like he was sailing near the Dominican Republic or, you know, more to be precise about the name of the island itself is Hispaniola. Some hot fish around there. I know, right? <laughs> uh, one of the first people to see, he was one of the first people to see not one but three manatees, and he thought they were mermaids. And he has said that they were not as half as beautiful as they are painted. Yeah, that's right. Christopher Columbus was an idiot who thought that <laughs> manatees were mermaids. I mean, they're kind of similar. They got one tail. They kind of look like uh, Steve Harvey with a fish tail. <laughs> that's rude. Thankfully for the sanity of the manatees, as far as we know, Christopher Columbus nor any of his sailors attempted to have a sexual congress with the manatees. Do they really say congress in there? It does. It says sexual congress. Wow. That's a new one. Yeah. Like conquest, maybe not congress. No, it's another, you know, version of sexual intercourse table. A meeting of minds and bodies. And it's just, you know, it's not because they were sexually frustrated. Because, you know, as they thought they were mermaids, they had no idea where they should put their willies, and they were probably too embarrassed to ask the manatees anyway. And, and all in all, it tells, you know, this sighting tells a lot about sexual frustration being at sea <laughs> for months on end and how desperate sailors must get if they can see a manatee, not the prettiest of the animals, and actually think that it's a woman, albeit half fish, half woman. We, we should also note that Christopher Columbus, you know, said that they... Uh, <laughs> says that they were not as pretty as <laughs> as they were painted, and any other person, any normal person, would say that they were a bit bloody ugly. But that's un- that's actually unfair to sane people. Sane sane people wouldn't think for one second that a manatee was a lady. Well, er- I mean, they've never seen a mermaid. You just heard of them, like, hey, that might be <laughs> one of those mermaid creatures. Ergo, sailors are the first are- person to fork that thing. Yeah, ergo, <laughs> sailors are just mentalists who would probably shag anything that stayed still for long enough. And they're a bunch of dirty boys. They are. Uh, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's the thing that blows my mind most about this is it happened in, well, he wrote down in his log in 1943. 1493. 14, 14, yeah, 1493. 1493, fool. Jesus Christ. I'm 1943. Not, I love that. I'm going to divorce you. You're no, so dumb. No. <laughs> but wrap your head around this one. Like, when did he so, might land on America? Well, let me see, discovered it, but 1492, right? Somewhere around there. Yeah, so like, that's one year later. He's like, hey, manatee over there so you know he's not sexually frustrated if he's been on land for about a year mm-hmm. so they saw that man he's like well we've already pillaged and kind of take our sexual congress with these native people let's go deal with these fish <laughs> he didn't really discover america i think it was more like he discovered the caribbean islands that's true but he did discover the insides of a manatee no, he didn't. I don't <laughs> believe that. I don't believe it for a second. I mean, you can't prove otherwise. Yeah, well, you can go back in time and ask him, because I'm going to hit you hard enough that you can go back in time and, and ask him. Oh, that'd be a wild trip right there. Mm-hmm. Now I finally have an answer to who would you talk to if you could talk to anyone <laughs> alive or dead. Did you really <laughs> fuck a manatee, Columbus? <laughs> no, you could sneak on his ship. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure I could blend get in as, like, a 1400s. No, you couldn't. You're too much of a pussy. You'd catch scurvy so fast. You'd probably die of it. <laughs> just shove some oranges up my butt. I'm going to shove some oranges up your butt in a minute. Don't you start me for a good time. Oh, gross. Go die somewhere. <laughs> so if you'd like to know more, just go ahead and look at our Patreon for those exclusive videos. Yeah. Patreon slash Wizard Paws Wildlife. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Wizard of Paws Wildlife. Pretty please. And our link tree is uh, Wizard of Paws Wildlife. Oh, yeah. Wizard of Paws Wildlife for pretty much everything. Yeah. Uh, and, and if, if you, you are interested in seeing Patreon, you 
maybe I'll have to set it as one of our future goals for me to shove citrus up my butt. But No, <laughs> absolutely not. You can go die somewhere with that bullshit. But for now, you can catch early releases of the show. Also, get a little link to our private Discord where you can ask us any questions or some of our past guests. We'll try to get some of those on. And you also get exclusive videos and, of course, helping the animals at the sanctuary. And if you would like to donate to help the animals at the sanctuary, you can send money through Venmo. Our Venmo um, log is at Wildlife Wizard. Uh, you can also send money through Cash App as well. And it all should be on the link tree, too. And that should all be on our link tree. But you can also rate and review the podcast to help us get more reach to other peoples. Yes. And uh, if you have any suggestions, you can feel free to leave the comments and we'll uh, we'll teach you about whatever you guys want to learn about. Oh, yeah. We'll research anything weird enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually looking for some really weird uh, things to talk about. And uh, my, I think my next one is going to be on the ring-tailed cats of North America. All right. I like cats. They're not actually felines. They're more raccoon family. Damn. But they're adorable, and they kind of look like Kiki. I mean, raccoons are pretty adorable. Uh, yeah, no, these are these are mostly found in, uh, you know, the West Coast. On the, on the West Side, that's what I believe. California raccoons. No. <laughs> <laughs> New Mexico <laughs> raccoons, bro. All right, too far west then. <laughs> yeah. New Mexico is a pretty good area for them. They like the the desert and stuff like that so we'll get into talking about those guys next time all right sounds good to me so you guys have a wild day and uh we'll see you next week yeah i think that'll do it for episode eight of the wizard Boz podcast i would just like to thank alan for helping us with the editing and all the other shows here on the all indiana podcast network and we will catch you next time so until then don't harass the wildlife yeah and stop feeding the wildlife please it's going to create issues, overpopulations of rodents especially. And it'll also drag those animals away and bring more diseases from your house to their no. territory and vice versa. I'll drag you away and give you diseases. I'm going <laughs> to fucking stab you in the neck right here on the air. <laughs> Everybody's going to hear your blood gushing. <laughs> as I freaking just laugh at you die. <laughs> <laughs> his face, you guys should see his face. <laughs> bro are you done recording no you're still going yes was this like a secret track yes <laughs> <laughs> post credit scene post credit scene exactly <laughs> but for real this is goodbye for real Talk bye bye see you next week <laughs> <laughs>